going to go ahead and get started then because we have a lot to do today. Yeah. So y'all, we've got a lot. Is the video running? Yes, it is. Thank you. So um, today is the bread class. I'm so excited that I am not teaching this one because it's hard. Um, no, I'm just kidding. You want to run through the introductions though? The, 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 I, I, about I, us? No, they know who we are. Uh, everybody might not. Okay, sure. Let's run through them real quick. <laughs> All right. Who are we? All right. So, uh, some of you who don't know us may be wondering why in the world two crazy pastors are teaching a cooking class in, in the middle of the sanctuary. And that is because um, when we lived in the States, Steve and I um, had a charity called Icebox Ministries. And we had a property called Icebox Urban Farm where we taught people how to cook healthy food, how to grow healthy food, and how to preserve healthy food. And Icebox Urban Farm was in one of the poorest neighborhoods in Augusta, Georgia, in, um, in the United States. We had an enormous greenhouse. That's a greenhouse there with a bunch of school kids hanging out. Um, they had been there for a school farm day. We had uh, community gardens. We had a teaching classroom where we taught people um, loads and loads of stuff. That's one of the slow cooker classes that we had. We worked with a lot of school kids, um, teaching them how to prepare healthy meals. And uh, so that's us doing some preservation classes, and I think that's actually a sushi class, which went over really, really well. So, um, but uh, a little over, well, it was about almost five years ago, um, Steve and I, uh, well, prior to that, we were called into ministry. We weren't sure what God had in store for us. We had a little farm of our own, and, um, and we were involved in ministry there in our local church. Uh, youth ministry, and uh, we had some small groups that, that we had started, and God said, you know what, we would love for you, you know, you eat. I'd love for you to be in Scotland, so we, we gave everything away, we sold our farm, and we moved to Scotland, and so uh, we were pastors in Glasgow before we were called to Largs, where we love and we hope never to leave, so, so that's a little bit about us and our past, and um, I think, Steve, are you going to go over some handy tools? I am. That's going to be the next thing. All so right. Kind of All right. Well, I'm going to turn it over to you. Do you have my scale somewhere? Is my scale back there? I have a scale right here. Okay. Will this one work? Yeah. yeah. So today, this is just an introduction to bread making, okay, which is one of my, um, is, is one of my passions, I guess I, sh I should say. It really has become something that I really like. And it wasn't always that way. About 10 or 12 years ago, I was really, I loved to cook, but I did not like the idea of baking. And the reason is because when you're cooking, when you've got something in a pan in front of you, you can make changes. You know, you see when the heat's too high or, you know, or it's too thick or too whatever, you know, you oh, this needs a little more of that. It needs a, it's not salty enough. You, you can change things right there Kind of like painting you know when i'm when i'm painting i can make changes i can get rid of something you know and i can paint over it baking is like i guess it's like um it's like pottery you know you got to do your work and then you put it in that oven and you're that's it you know for an hour or 30 minutes or 12 minutes or whatever whatever happens happens and when you open that door you see and i did not like the idea of relinquishing that kind of control to just say i gotta do all my planning and get it all right and then just hope it turns out so that kind of i was kind of daunted by that and at our future plan we do a future planning uh event we kind of go away and 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 look at the the year ahead uh, a couple times a year um and tasha and i about 10 or 11 years ago one of the things that came out of my future planning was that i wanted to learn how to bake really good bread, like really good bread, like the baguettes that I'd had in Europe. I'm, I'm going to do that. How hard could it be? People do it. People have been doing it for thousands of years. Surely I can learn how to do that. And so about that time, I read a book, or I heard about a book, called In Search of the Perfect Loaf by a guy named Samuel Fromarks. It's a great book. It's a narrative about him going to France and learning how to how to bake bread and then he won some big contest in Washington DC for the best baguettes or something like that but anyway he learned how to he learned how to make uh, 
McGrid. And I, I read this while we were away. We went off on a cruise. And I read this book, and I said, okay, I'm going to do this. And so I did. And uh, so I've been doing it ever since. And I just want to let you know, I'm no professional. I'm just an amateur who's uh, read a lot of books and done a lot of baking over the last 10, uh, 10 or 11 years. And uh, so if you're interested in baking, um, bread and things like that, and mostly bread is what I'm interested in and what we're going to talk about today, um, there are some handy tools that would be very helpful for you to have. The first thing is a scale. If you don't have one and you intend to do some baking, not just occasionally, and you don't care how it turns out, but if you if you if you want it to turn out right and you want to know, you know, how to how to make it better next time, get you a scale and, and measure things because um, well, I'll show you why in, in in just a little bit. But get a scale. They only cost about, um, you know, less than 15 pounds on Amazon, and uh, they're really handy to have. So scale is a very important thing. Another important tool to have is what's called a bench scraper. You have a little plastic one there in front of you. You can use this to shape and form and cut things and uh, also to clean up, you know, because it's nice to scrape flour off the of things. Um, also, uh, a baking sheet, you know, one that goes into your oven. If all you have in your oven is that tray that's got the ripples on it, a nice flat baking sheet would come in real handy because things come out better. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, parchment paper. Uh, you've got a couple of sheets of parchment paper. In my experience, parchment paper is invaluable because uh, there's nothing worse than spending a lot of time on some bread or a cake or something like that just to have it stick. And then you have to scrape it and, you know, it's very disappointing. Um, a good heavy glass or what I call the ubiquitous bowl. Do y'all know what a ubiquitous bowl is? The, this Tasha, that's a word that Tasha and I have come up with for the bowl that you find just about in everybody's house. It's ubiquitous, it's everywhere. That bowl right there, and we've got one. And uh, so it comes in real handy. And the reason it comes in handy because it's nice and heavy so you can, so you can mix dough in it and it doesn't you know, you don't lift up the bowl too. It, it's got some heft to it. Um, another thing is a good spatula for spreading oil and for getting uh, dough out of your bowl. Some loaf pans. Um, I brought one that I use a lot. That's this one. It's made out of some kind of space age uh, material. Um, I can't remember what it's called. It's made in France, but it's. Uh, uh, it's called uh, exoglass, and it sounds like plastic. It feels like plastic, but this thing will go into a 250-degree oven, and it comes out just fine, and bread doesn't stick to it. You just oil it every now and then, and it comes out really nice. And I'll show you a loaf that I made with this in just a little bit. Say it again. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've got several tins. I make my banana bread in tins. I use those... Um, are they sil they're silicone oh, the, silicone. That, you, that you put in? It's like parchment, but you, know, you can wash it and put it in so it doesn't stick. Yeah, uh, mine, mine are about to wear out. I need to replace them. Uh, so low pan is always good. Uh, Dutch ovens and cast iron. Um, I'll show you a little later on when we talk about sourdough. Uh, I have some sourdough that I make in. Uh, I use a cast iron uh, pot. And with a lid like a Dutch oven and that's always good to have another thing that's good to have is good books and I've got several that uh, I'll refer to but I want to just let you know I've already talked about that one can you tell this is my favorite <laughs> <laughs> so I keep my recipes in here what ones that I printed out or ones that I've written, written. and I'll tell you this is why a scale comes in handy because every time you bake Keep precise measurements of, of exactly what you did. How much water did you add? How much flour did you use? What kind of flour was it? How long did you need it? How long did you let it rise? And write it down. And then if something good happens or if something bad happens, you can go back to it and say, okay, I need to tweak that just a little bit. And you'll see when we get to the roll recipe that it's been tweaked a little bit because I've made it a great many times and I've come to understand exactly what needs to be done. But a good book is a very good thing. And Paul Hollywood's bread 
It was an awesome book that I can't recommend high, more, high, highly enough. Um, he's got several recipes for different kinds of breads in here. And then he tells you, after he tells you how to make the bread, he'll say, okay, here's a meal that you can use. So he tells you how to make crumpets, and then he tells you how to make eggs benedict with the crumpets. So it's a really good book, Paul Holligan's Bread. Um, and there's some great, some great recipes in here. Now today we're going to talk about um, three kinds of uh, three kinds of bread, and the first of them we're talking about three kinds of bread that rise, that uh, form bubbles in them, they get nice and fluffy. And then people have been oh, here's two more little tools. This is called a dough whisk. I'm going to use this in just a minute. My daughter gave me this, and this is something that you don't necessarily need, but I love this thing. I've used it. You know, you can see it's kind of turned in colors, but uh, that's really handy. And this is called a banneton. We'll talk about that when we get to sourdough in just a little bit. But let's, uh, without further ado, let's move on. Uh, the first kind of bread that rises, that gets bubbles in it, that gets air in it, is what's called soda bread. And soda bread is called that because you use bicarbonate of soda in it. So it's a uh, you know, that's just a chemical. It's also, uh, we talk about baking powder and baking soda. There's a slight difference, uh, but their action is basically the same. Um, and basically, that's a chemical that's got sodium and it's got two carbon atoms on it and it wants to let them go. And when sodium bicarbonate interacts with, uh, with an acid like vinegar, do you ever mix uh, baking soda and vinegar together? I used to do that all the time and my mom would get so annoyed with me because I wasted her vinegar and her baking soda and also made a mess in the kitchen, you know. But it's fun, you know, because it was, you know, because yeah, try it, Faith, try it when you get home. Baking soda and vinegar, it's fun to watch. But, uh, but you can also bake bread with that same process by using baking powder and an acid like buttermilk or yogurt or things like that. And we're going to we're going to talk about a recipe where where the acid is uh, is yogurt and we're using baking powder. Little trivia for you, baking powder in its modern form was invented in 1843 down in Birmingham, England by a guy named Alfred Bird because his wife was allergic to yeast and he wanted to make a bread that uh, she wouldn't react with. Uh, you probably know him better for his other product, mm -hmm. birds, custard. And now you know the rest of the story. Well, let's get on to, uh, to our first soda bread. Now, in America, in the South, there's a thing called biscuits. And they're not the kind of biscuits that, that we, <coughs> we know here. It's, you know, when you all say biscuits, it's a totally different thing. But, but we've been eating biscuits for breakfast and, and, and for all kinds of meals for uh, for a long time, and really, I was thinking about it this week, and there are three times, three kinds of biscuits. First of all, there's the old-fashioned buttermilk biscuits that your grandmother made. Tasha made these a couple of years ago. They're a little involved, and you cut them out, and and uh, it's hard to make something like a breakfast sandwich with these because they're a little bit crumbly. They'll kind of fall apart on you, but that's what makes them good. So they're delicious, but they're a little trickier to make. Then there's also these biscuits that come in a can that you can buy at a grocery store. These are Pillsbury uh, Brands biscuits. Uh, my grandmother used to call these WAP biscuits because you take the can, the can is like a paper tube and you WAP it on the, uh, on the counter top to open it. Uh, and, they're, they're those, and they're flaky. See how they got those layers in them? But then there's another kind of uh, kind of biscuit, and that's the biscuit that you can get at just about any fast food restaurant in the South. Places like Hardee's and Bojangles and even McDonald's and uh, all KFC. those KFC and uh, Chick Fil A. Every fast food place in the South will have a breakfast biscuit. You know, uh, Chick Fil A's got one with a with a fried chicken, you know, boneless fried chicken. That's Delicious stuff. <laughs> but um, but over the past few years, particularly since we moved uh, to the UK, Tasha and I have been trying to replicate that kind of biscuit that you could make a breakfast sandwich with. 
because when you make a breakfast sandwich, they have these biscuits that, that don't fall apart. They've got a little texture to them and uh, they're nice and chewy and soft. They're a little flatter than grandma's biscuits that she used to make. They look like scones, I guess. They, uh, they scones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so is the biscuit you're talking about, is it more like a roll? What would you call a roll? So you, because you put something in it? And it's a little bit it's kind of like it's kind of like a scone a savory scone but the texture is a little more roll like yeah it's not scones are denser from from what i've seen so here's a here's a commercial for uh for a breakfast sandwich uh biscuit so so you know what we're talking about this is real buttermilk and when you mix it with flour it makes real biscuit dough, which is where real biscuits come from. This is made from scratch. The Mile High Bacon, Egg, and Cheese Biscuit with thick cut Applewood smoked bacon pieces, only at Hardee's. <laughs> so that's the kind of biscuit we've been trying trying to make. And uh, we, we tried, I, I, we must have tried uh, 10 or 12 different ways to make this thing and we really kind of by accident maybe three three years ago or so uh, came across this recipe and we couldn't believe how easy it is and we've made it here and we've made it uh, back home and it's and it's really good you know with uh, on a breakfast sandwich it's also good with what we call biscuits and gravy uh, which is sausage gravy that uh, that we make that we eat with it so that's what we're going to learn how to make but um, you'll find out that this is not only useful if you ever visit the American South, you can show them you know how to make a good biscuit. Yeah, it's also got some other uses as well. So let's, uh, let's learn how to make this, all right? Okay. Okay, and again, this is a soda bread. Um, so what you got in front of you, oh, and let me give you, uh, let me give you the recipe. Pass some of those around. Now the recipe that we're going to make today makes two biscuits because I figured that'd be nice, like for you and Faith, or you know, Danny. You just want to make a couple of biscuits. Usually, I just if I'm doing it for me, but if we're doing it for us, we usually make four. So we double up this recipe. So this recipe, um, you can multiply it pretty easy. You can make, you can double it, you can triple it, whatever you'd like. Um, this morning. Uh, as a taster, when I made the taster biscuits, uh, I tripled it, and it triples just fine. You might have to add a little more, a little more water, but we'll talk about that in just a second. So, what your recipe says there? Can I? Is there an extra one somewhere? Uh, yeah. I just want to make sure I can look at it. So, what your recipe says there is that we're going to take 75 grams of plain full-fat yogurt which sometimes is hard to get. I went down to Tesco today and everything was 0% fat. I was like, what in the world? So get the full fat stuff, you know, because it uh, just makes better, makes better biscuits for one thing. So you got 75 grams of full fat yogurt in your big ramekin here. You notice you have two ramekins. In your big one, you have 75 grams of self-raising flour. So that's got uh, bicarbonate of soda. It's got a raising agent in it. So we're going to mix that into it, okay? Mix that together. Everybody has a fork, and that's what we're going to mix with in just a minute. Now we're also going to do um, a half teaspoon of salt. Yes. Oh, yeah, that's the big one. That's it. Yeah, yeah that's it. So we're going to do a half teaspoon of salt. I know these are hard to read. You have to get the light. You have to get the light just right on. Them. So a half teaspoon of salt, and then I'm going to pass this around. We can pass the salt around, and then we're going to do a half teaspoon of baking powder. Invented by Alfred Bird in 1843 in Birmingham. Um, Birmingham, sorry. 
So we're going to mix that just uh, with your fork and your bowl. Okay, get that really nice and mixed up. And inevitably, you will find that it's you've got some flour left over. And you probably are going to need to add about a teaspoon or two teaspoons of water. And that's why there's water here. But I'm not, I didn't write that on your, you know, I didn't write that specifically uh, on your recipe because depending on what kind of yogurt you use, you may need more or less. Some, some yogurt's really thin and some is, some is much thicker. If you use Greek yogurt, which you can, you'll probably need about 50 grams of, of water because it's really thick. So just add a, maybe about a teaspoon of water to that. Again, start with a little because you can always add. And if you, but if you, oh, I think there's one, there's one there. Yeah, I should drink it out of there. Oh, here, here you go. What you want is just for it to sort of um, come away from the sides of the bowl and incorporate all that flour without being too liquidy. See how that looks? So just really stir that around. Sorry? Oh, she may. Um, let me ask. Tasha, can we ask you something? Okay, everybody got their baking powder and their salt in their biscuits. Now you'll notice you have another ramekin of, of uh, self-raising flour, right? So what I want you to do is clear, clear a spot right in front of you just about the size of a pie pan or a pizza or whatever, and just sprinkle some flour on that. Probably use about half of the flour that you have. Okay, and then take your uh, take your biscuit dough. That's it, yeah, right there. And then what you're gonna do is put some flour on your hands And then we're just going to pat this, pat this down. It'll want to, it'll want to stick to you. So just keep, so keep flour on your hands. This is one of those times when it's okay to, to have plenty of flour to this. And we're just going to kind of shape it. I like to shape it into kind of a rectangle, and I'm going to cut it in half. Yeah, what I do is just rub my hands in the flour like this. That's what Danny was doing. Yeah. yeah, and then when I've cut them in half, here's what I like to do. I like to really squeeze the sides so it comes up like that. You see how that looks? I've cut it in half, and really gone around. So it's kind of a tall, looks like a tall scone, see that? And then I'm gonna take it and I'm just gonna pat that down. I don't want to overwork this too much because it'll get tough, but I also don't want it to be so flaky that it just falls apart. So when you're finished, it ought to look something like this. And if you will, just put your two biscuits on your parchment uh, on the opposite side of your name. So just on that, on that other edge. Now what we're going to do now, let me wait till everybody gets their biscuits made. Those are looking good. Faith's got nice tall biscuits. You can make them as thick or as thin as you want to. Those are good, Dan. Excellent. 
Yeah. Be sure to put them on the other, the opposite side so that they'll fit in the, you know, put them on the other side of, to your name over on this side. So. Oh, Tasha, I don't know. Oh, it's upside down. Oh, as long as your name's on it, it doesn't matter. We just don't want you eating somebody else's biscuits. It'll be okay. All right, now here's what we're going to do. eat somebody else's biscuits. Now here's what we're going to do next. I've got some melted butter here. Don't ask me how much. It's just a hunk. All right, so just some. You'll, you'll, I always do too much. Um, and what you're going to do is you're going to put your fork in this butter. And then when it comes around, this butter will come around in just a minute. You're going to put your fork in this butter. And then you're going to make some, you're just going to stab your biscuit. I like to make a little kind of a star shape, you know, like five points, you know, like a little person with uh, a head and arms and and legs. So I do it like that. See how I've done that? And I pretty much go all the way through. Just shove your, put your fork in the butter and then just stab it in there. You can do a cross if you want to. You can do just four lines straight down. Doesn't matter. What you're doing is you're allowing that, um, uh, allowing that uh, dough not to raise too much. Uh, and you're also giving some channels to get some butter down in there. So after you put those holes in there, we're going to brush the very top with butter. Now don't hold back on that because it because this is what makes it good. Okay. So I'm going to pass this around. So dip your wipe wipe the flour off your fork, and then uh, dip your fork in there. Stab your biscuit a few times, and then brush it with. Uh, with butter. There you go. That's just fine. Yeah, make you make any kind of design you want to. Let me show you what I'm doing. So I've tripled this biscuit recipe. I got a handful of shredded Parmesan. I'm just gonna put that in. Okay, maybe a handful. Maybe a handful and a half. I'm gonna put that in there. A little bit more water, about three times as much water. Okay, so I've, I'm just, I've, all I've done is tripled this recipe. And um, and I put about a handful of half, a handful and a half of um, of uh, parmesan in there. And all I'm going to do is kind of flatten this out on the parchment. I'm going to take my fork and I'm just going to Just put some put some holes in there with my fork. I'm gonna pour some olive oil on it. And probably get a little butter from this too, but that'd, that'd be alright. Oh, too much oil? What? It'll take more oil than you think it will. <coughs> See, I'm gonna need just a touch more down here. Alright, so I'm just covering the top with uh, with some olive oil. Then I'm going to take some more Parmesan. Tasha, how much uh, Parmesan was in this? Can you, can you remind me? 150, 170. 170. So this is probably I've probably gone through 150 or so, and I'm going to do just some coarse ground black pepper, a little bit of uh, garlic granules. Mm -hmm. 
And then, this is one of my new favorite things that we just discovered a couple of weeks ago. It's called blackthorn salt. It's salt that's made over in air. And they uh, make it from the seawater there. They have this big tower that, that's all full of blackthorns and that drips down and it, it evaporates and they, the salt comes from there. And it, um, actually, we ordered this from the from the Black Thorn Company. Oh, okay, excellent. But it is delicious, and it really does taste just like the sea right out here. I mean, it's really familiar. So I'm just going to put a little of this on top as well. Now, if you want to, you can also do basically this same thing and let it be a pizza crust. If you're gonna do a pizza crust, put it in the oven for maybe five minutes, let it get um, uh, let it get a little done, and then put your pizza sauce. Because if you put your sauce on first, it'll tend to get a little soggy. So put it in, but you can also, uh, can I give this to somebody? Um, oh, I didn't put oregano. <coughs> I'm going to put a little oregano, I'm sorry. Did you put uh, some garlic on there as well? I did. Okay, good. Yeah, I'm going to put a little oregano. I have put the uh, oregano in the mix as well. I did that a couple of days ago. It's I'm very versatile, it. and it, you can see that it's so fast. Yeah. And so, if what you've got, you know, let's say you've got soup that you've made, and you just want, it, it's, it's similar, I think, to dough balls. Mm -hmm. as far as the recipe is concerned. Yeah. So you could even use this as a dough ball recipe. If you've made a stew in your crock pot, do the same thing, put it in balls, set it on top of your stew, put the lid on, mm -hmm. and they'll, they'll do it as dough balls. So yeah. I'll take that. Okay. And here's another cool thing about this recipe is if you're making pizza crust or if you just want uh, some bread to go with soup or whatever, you can do it, um, you can cook it in a skillet. So you've got a, you know, a frying pan. Mm -hmm. Put a little oil in it. Um, Pat it out as thick as you want it, and do it sort of like a pancake, or what we what we call a hoe cake if it was made with cornmeal. And you can cook it that way. Now here's what's a cool thing, and I and I know this because I did it for breakfast this week. You can do some bacon in your pan first, and then make some of this. Do two sort of thinner sliced, you know, thinner pieces of of this, you know, about what this recipe calls for. Do it too, and then cook it in the pan that you cooked your bacon in. Then you got a bacon sandwich because you got two pieces, and you haven't turned your oven on. But you've made the bread and the bacon all in the same, all in the same pan. All right. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's move on then. Okay. Yeah. It's 12 minutes again. Oh, I'm sorry. That's on your recipe. Um, it's uh, 220 degrees, which is hot. So, but I do 220 fan, and it takes exactly 12 minutes with our oven at home to get those biscuits just right. Um, and the focaccia, and the focaccia as well. You'll figure out exactly how long it takes. Maybe 13 minutes. Maybe 11. You know, but but just figure that out. And again, write it down, uh, and you'll know for next time. All right, if y'all give me just a minute, I'm gonna cut it. So yes, exactly. So that's you could use buttermilk instead of yogurt. You could. Uh, the buttermilk here is a little bit different. Um, they sell it much. You know, in, in, in the states, we can get you know we can get a gallon of buttermilk. Very difficult to get. Yeah, here it's little, but the yogurt works exactly the same way, and I think it's a little nicer. We can also make. Butter. You can, yeah. Milk and lemon just looks mm -hmm. exactly right. And it works beautifully. Do I? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
uh, with, with these biscuits. Um, some things that we like to do. Uh, this is one of my favorite breakfasts right here. That's smoked salmon and a poached egg and some capers and some tomatoes. And there's probably some Dijon mustard on there and some mayonnaise as well. A little black pepper and salt. And the, you can see there's a biscuit under, underneath there. It's delicious. Um, and that's just a good old fashioned uh, biscuits and sawmill gravy. Now, sawmill gravy is a white gravy. It's a lot like the bechamel sauce that you learn to make, but we've got Southern sausage. Uh, and in fact, we're going to taste that in just a little bit with some sausage that, that we made. Um, so it's, so it's, it's, it's authentic. So you can't ever say you never had biscuits and gravy anymore after today because you have shown up had biscuits and gravy. So, so that's coming up. Oh, and oh, and here's another thing. This is Tasha's breakfast uh, from some some time ago. That's an egg and cheese and bacon on that uh, on that biscuit, and it looks like a lot of mayonnaise too. So. Oh yeah. Anyway, so that's a wonderful breakfast, by the way. And you can do that really quick. You can whip that up in you know about 12 minutes uh, if you're doing these biscuits. They also freeze really well. Yeah. So you can make a batch, you know, double, triple, quadruple, make a batch, and then fry out your bacon and even scramble your eggs and put those on there. A little bit of cheese if you want to, um, a little butter on the, on the bread. Put it together, wrap it up in plastic film, you know, cling film, and then a little foil, pop it in a zip-top bag and freeze it. And then when you're ready for breakfast, you know, so the night before, you take it out, put it in your fridge, and it'll thaw overnight the next morning. Um, take the foil off, pop it in the microwave for like 10 or 15 seconds, and you got breakfast. Oh, yeah. yeah. I thought you may freeze the bread. And you then can. Yeah. But you can totally freeze the bread as well, but you can go in there and make up your breakfast rolls and then have that. It just makes mornings really easy. So, something to think about. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. So, the second way that we can make our bread rise and uh, uh, and we've been doing it for a couple hundred years now, is, uh, is with yeast. Now, when we talk about yeast, um, we're talking about the same thing that is in sourdough, and that's a, a little microbe, a little fungus called Saccharomyces cerevisiae. That's its name. Now, we didn't know that was its name until about 150 years ago or so when Louis Pasteur and those, those folks started looking through microscopes and saying, wow, there's microbes in here. And, um, you know, at first people thought they were crazy, but then they were like, well, no, it really turns out there, there is. And, uh, and so we figured out that what uh, made the, the, the bread that the bakers made and also what made beer ferment and get alcoholic was either baker's yeast, which is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, or brewer's yeast, which is kind of a cousin, a little bit uh, similar, but it's still a kind of, that kind of micro. And so, um, uh, so now you can go to the grocery store and just buy a little packet. Uh, I'm assuming it's freeze dried. Tasha, is that right? Is, is yeast you get? Uh, uh, yes. Freeze dried, like yeah. We used to have a freeze dried. We loved it. But uh, so you get a freeze dried yeast. Hydrated as well. Yeah, and and it's just um, it's just that microbe uh, isolated, you know, with with, with nothing else, and uh, and we can add that add that to our yeast and or add that to our to our dough and what happens is that the, the dough and the water wakes that yeast up wakes that microbe up from its dormant state and it starts eating away at uh, at the flour at the sugars in it and and and, uh, and as it does its thing it produces carbon dioxide as well it can also produce alcohol in your in your starter but we'll talk about that a little bit. And that's why people sometimes use use yeast uh, to make uh, to make wine and beer. And things. So, yeah, that's right. So, but we're going to talk about uh, our yeast rolls that we make here uh, at Common Ground on Thursdays. Have y'all experienced those? Okay. So you know what we're talking about. So, uh, so let's uh, let me let you. So here's what we're going to do. I'm just going to demonstrate the. Um, the recipe, and then I'll give you the recipe so you can do it, do it at home as well. Because basically, you have to mix it, and then you have to let it rise for about an hour and a half. And since we didn't want to be here all day, we said uh, let's let's break this up. So we're gonna we're gonna first of all show you the 
the process. Then we're going to do a little kneading because you may not have a mixer. We typically use a mixer only because I make them 50 at a time and I'm not going to wear my arms out. So, so let's do this. So I've got the ingredients here for what I call a single batch. I usually make these in double batches. So I'm going to give you this recipe. kitchen aid for this so I'm gonna um, so I'm gonna uh, use this mixer and, and let it mix and then we're gonna do some kneading and after 10 minutes I'll be able to show you what your dough ought to look like so you so you have an idea okay so basically I'm going to add 520 grams of strong white bread flour now if you don't already know there are several types of bread flour there's plain flour there's strong bread flour, there's extra strong bread flour, and there's self-raising flour. That's the most typical one. We use self-raising flour to make those biscuits, and it's already, like I said, it's already got that leavening agent, that raising agent in it. Um, so it's, it's especially good for like soda breads and things like that. Um, but what we're using now is strong white bread flour that has a higher protein content than just plain flour. You can, in most recipes, interchange plain flour and strong bread flour, you may notice a slight difference. Um, maybe that it's not quite as uh, not, not quite as chewy, not quite got the strength uh, if you use plain flour. So I'm adding the um, strong white bread flour, uh, 55 grams of sugar, seven grams of instant yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, this is. Mm -hmm. 15 grams of salt and 45 grams of cold or uh, room temperature butter. Now, if you're kneading this, we're going to find out in just a minute. And when you're kneading this, it's it's nice to have this butter in here because the butter is a good indicator as you're kneading whether you're done or not. If you can still see butter and it's not been completely incorporated you need to keep kneading because by the time this this is well kneaded and well mixed you won't see that butter it'll, it'll just have incorporated into the mix and then we're going to add uh, 320 grams of lukewarm water now a lot of times you'll read recipes that say um, make a well in your flour and put your yeast in here and then put your salt over here on the side they get all complicated about it i've never found that to be helpful at all because in about 30 seconds it's all going to be mixed together anyway so what's the point yes we wanted to let people know john suggested going if you have yours go ahead and um i've got a few more they're not quite done so if you haven't gotten it it's just because i want them to be a little browner um you can split it open like you would a scone put some butter in it the, the gravy that you have is the sausage gravy. Please feel free to smother oh, that's that. that's a good idea. There's a little bit more if you want to pass it down. Smother it with the gravy. Go ahead and eat while Steve is demonstrating. Yeah, I'm and, just going to uh, turn this on. Um, we'll, we'll, take, uh, we'll take 10 minutes and, um, and let, and let y'all eat these. Let's see what they're like. Shaking my tail like 
Excuse me just a minute. Alexa, set a timer for 10 minutes. I realize I didn't have my theory. How's it going in here? Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Alexa, set a timer for 10 minutes. Alexa, set a timer for 10 minutes. Alexa, set a timer for 10 minutes. Alexa, set a timer And then you have a box on your table if you um, want to take anything home, but feel free to eat some of this. Yeah, and if you want more, Greg, you just say. Yes, there's plenty. There's a there's a pitcher in the middle of the table here with some more gravy in it, and we have loads, so please help yourself. So that's how much you ought to have. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so if y'all don't mind, I'm going to eat my biscuit and gravy as well. Well, first of all, I tell you, First of all, you take the sausage, and um, um, the the sausage in, in the States would have a little more fat in it. So here, I have to use some lard or some bacon grease or some butter or something, you know, and cook the, cook the sausage off of that. The sausage, you know, we made, so it's ground pork and a lot of different spices and things. About, about a dozen, a dozen um, uh, spices in it. Cook, cook that in the pan, take it off, and then you um, make a roux with, um, if you need some more oil, you can either, either use butter or lard or olive oil, whatever you like, uh, and, and flour, and then you add milk to that. So this is really a milk gravy, so it's a lot like a bechamel. Uh -huh. And you and you make that up, and then you add the, you add some, I add some cayenne pepper, uh, some black pepper, a little salt, uh, usually a lot of salt. Because there's so much flour, <clears throat> and then you, when you, when that's all nice and smooth and looks good, you add the gravy back to it. I mean, not the gravy. You add the sausage back to it. You want to come and manage your table. Hold it. Yeah. Sawmill gravy. Sometimes, sometimes they'll just call it sausage gravy, but traditionally it's called sawmill gravy. Yeah. Oh, I made that. <laughs> oh, you can't buy that. <laughs> did you try that? Did you try that? You saw that so sauce, so gravy. Oh, well, but you can see yeah, how to make it. That's right. Absolutely. We can show you how to make it. Thank you. Yeah, I need to do a gravy class. But it really is so similar to the bechamel that Tasha taught how to make a couple of weeks ago. You know, you, you start with the... Uh, you start well. You start by cooking your sausage, and then you take your sausage out of the pan, and then you make a roux with uh, bacon grease or lard or olive oil or butter, whatever you like. You add flour to that. You know, cook that up so it, so it gets a, a nice brown to it. You want it a little brown, and then you just add milk and stir that up until it's the thickness that you want. Add some salt, some cayenne, uh, some black pepper, then put your sausage back in. And that sausage great. Okay. It also is made. Is the, did you talk about the haggis? Oh, I didn't. Oh, it's brilliant made with haggis. It really is, yeah. Oh, yeah. One of my favorite things. Several years ago, when we came over uh, for a holiday, 2017, we wanted biscuits and gravy, but we had we had haggis the night before. We had leftover haggis, and I thought, sort of like sausage. And it really is good. So what we're going to do now, this is a double batch of the um, roll dough uh, without the water. So I'm about to add the water. And I'm going to stir this around a little bit. And then I'm going to divide it up. How many of you have a mixer? That Would you use a mixer with a dough hook? 
So if you don't have a mixer, or if you just want to do it by hand, what you're going to do is just mix your dough really well. Give me a second and I'll mix it up. Oh, that's right. We'll need to give you some olive oil. We'll do yeah. that when you're ready. Thank you. No, go ahead and do that because I'm. I'll okay. distribute this. Do you want to show here. John how much you're looking at? Um, well, right now it doesn't really matter because it's. Um, I'll tell you what, John. Just do about like that. Okay. And then when John puts the oil on your workspace, if you'll clear a workspace out where you can do some kneading. And then take both of your hands and just spread it around so it's a nice, um, a nice even layer. That might have been a little too much, John, but it's okay. So, I'm, so get it on your hands. So remember, this is a double batch, so you'll be working with half, half this much. So it won't be quite so overwhelming. All right. So when so when you're kneading, the basic movement is to just use the this part of your hand and push. But again, you can you can read some very pedantic, very OCD people who are very particular about how to um, about how to knead. The fact is, if you're stretching and squeezing and working that dough, you're doing okay. So don't worry too much about your technique. Just work it a lot, you know, don't don't be gentle with it. You know, slap it if you want to, it's okay. Get your aggressions out. If you've had a bad day, take it out on this dough because that's what it's there for. So I'm gonna, give you, all, I'm gonna give you each some. There you go. We're doing the bread earlier, mm -hmm. and you did it with flour. Right. And this is oil. That is an excellent question. Thank you. I should have mentioned that. The reason you're doing it on oil now and not flour is because when you do it on flour, you're gonna your tendency is to add more flour, and you think, oh, this is too wet. This recipe doesn't need any more flour. If you add more flour to it, you're gonna get dry um, dough. Um, so it's important to do this on oil. Um, you can, w when you use flour for things like this, be aware that as you're working it with the flour and you put flour in, you're putting more flour into your recipe. Would that be, and I used to do it, uh -huh. so I never really liked beaten bread with yeast because it just didn't work. Mm -hmm. My bread didn't rise very well. Mm -hmm. Would that be why? One of the reasons, okay, that's a good question. One of the reasons we're kneading, in fact, the reason we're kneading is to form gluten. What you're, what you're going to do, now when that yeast does its work, it's going to produce gas and it's going to make bubbles in that bread. If you don't need it, there's not enough structure, there's not enough strength in your dough for the bubbles to stay. The, the walls of the bubbles are weak and they just pop. And when it gets in the oven, it just pops and it flattens out or while you're trying to rise it. So that's why it's important to knead it enough. If you don't need it enough, it might look just fine, but you'll find that it doesn't rise the way you want it to uh, before you put it in the oven or after you put it in the oven. And it's because what you're doing is forming gluten, which is protein strands that are gonna make that dough nice and strong and able to hold the, the bubbles of gas that are formed by the yeast. Thank you for that. So gluten-free as a technique? Well, gluten-free, it can depend on your um, on the flour that you use. For instance, if you use rice flour, you, it doesn't form gluten. So um, when you do gluten-free bread, sometimes you'll find that it's really dense. Yeah, and then, exactly, and the reason is because what gluten does is provides that strength. So it's very hard to find a good airy uh, gluten-free bread. Yeah. Let me wash my hands. I'll be right back. Oh, that's 
think it's a case of... Yeah, it's going to go through several stages of sticky and uh, and annoying before yeah. it gets kind of kind of firms up. But you'll know when it starts to get there. You'll feel it change its texture. Um, Elasticity. Yeah, it, it has some strength. Now this is a is a recipe. Um, this dough is what's called a slack dough. It's got a lot of um, liquid in it, so it's not gonna it's not gonna form a nice a nice ball shape for you. It's gonna kind of going to kind of sink down and that's okay because that's the way this this recipe is now when you're when you're finished when you're making this when you're finished kneading or when your mixer's finished you're going to put it in an oiled bowl you just take a bowl now if i was at home this would be my nice heavy ubiquitous bowl yeah. but just take some oil oh. and go around the go around the outside <coughs> With this recipe, it's okay if you get a good amount. Just don't get poured out if you need to. And let me show you what this should look like when you're done. This is when my spatula comes in handy. Let me show you what this is good for. So you just take it, go in there like this. A good spatula will help you not leave anything behind when you um, when you get your dough out. I want to complain to KitchenAid though. They're um, well, they're. Their newer models of this mixer don't have a handle on the bowl. Ours at home has a handle. And you've got oil on your hands. It's hard to hold this thing. <coughs> so let me just come around and show you. That's what you're going for when you're done. So you know you're done when it looks like that. See how nice and tight that skin is? Mm -hmm. It's still very, you know, very liquidy, not very solid. Mm -hmm. But see how that, it's got a nice tight skin on it. So that's what you're going for. That's how you know when you're, see how nice that stretches it. Yeah, nice, nice and tight that skin is. Let me show you. Oh yeah, you're in the very sticky stage right there. So that's what that when it looks like that, you know you're done. See how see it's not sticking to my hands? No. And that's how, that's that's when you're done. And so when we're done kneading, we're gonna put it in put it in an oiled bowl, cover it with uh, either a tea towel or cling film. I usually cover it with a cling film and I write the time on the cling film. And then I tell, well, I'll tell you why I do that is because I have told Alexa to set a timer for 90 minutes before and then she forgot and, or, or didn't do it or whatever. And then I go to look at my dough and I can't remember how long it's been. Um, so I write the time on just in case. I so I so know. And then what I do is uh, we have a dehydrator. So I put it in the dehydrator at 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, you can also just put it in a nice warm place. Not too warm, don't put it in an oven, uh, unless you have a, uh, a bread proving setting on, on your oven. Just a, just a nice warm spot. Um, like I said, this usually takes about 90 minutes uh, to rise to get uh, where it's ready to roll. So I'm gonna put this away, and uh, then we're gonna clean up that mess in front of you. So if you could, use your scraper and uh, try to scrape as much off of your workspace as you can. And uh, then we'll go around with the bowl and collect your kneaded dough. All of which look like they need about that much more time. So. 
hands. Yeah, if you need to wash your hands, uh, go ahead. Steve. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it, maybe it's okay. We can just put it somewhere and let it ride. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a good time to add. Um, a lot of times you'll hear about baking. That baking is about doing exactly the same thing every time, you know, using exactly the same amount of water and flour and all that sort of thing. Well, that's true to a certain extent, but your hands are going to be different temperatures. There's going to be different humidity in the air. The temperature of the room where you are is going to be different. Um, the flour that you use could be different. So don't think that that every that once you get a, develop a feel for what things should look like, don't be afraid to say this needs a little more water or this could use a little more flour because you'll because you'll because you'll know that you'll instinctively see that and that can happen because you're not in a laboratory, you know you're in the real world. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. I know. I hated it, but I couldn't figure out how to actually do. I said, you know what? We've, we've got to. You know, this the value of this is it's a demonstration. You know, so that's we. I finally kind of came to terms with that. <coughs> out of a de out of the dehydrator. Like in this, it might take two hours. But what you want it to do is double. So take note of, of how big it is. And then when it's twice as big, you know, that's, that's when you're ready to shape it. All right, so here's what's going to happen now. So in our imaginary hypothetical world, you've kneaded the dough. You've put it uh, away to rise. It's doubled in size. Okay? And you're about to make some rolls. Is it by magic? Uh, uh, here's one I prepared earlier. <laughs> so if this had risen, and again, this is just a portion of uh, of a double batch. So it, yours is probably going to look different than, than this. It's going to be a little bigger than this. Now, let me tell you something that I do when when I um, take this uh, take this off the out of the dehydrator, it's risen, I will sit it on the scale, cool. right? Tar the scale, take the dough out, put it back, see how much the dough weighs. And then I'll divide that weight, I'll say, Alexa, divide 953 by 12, or 25, or 50, however many rolls I wanna make. And I know that I usually make 50 of these small rolls. But if you wanted to make breakfast rolls, you'd probably want them to be at least double that size. So you might make, out of this recipe that you have here, you might make 12 rolls. Or you might make eight nice, good size rolls. So you could divide it by eight and then say, okay, each one of them needs to be 75 grams. And you can actually weigh your dough and know that they're all gonna be consistent. Now, if it's just for your family, divide it into eight. You know, and somebody will get a big roll, somebody will get a small roll, it doesn't matter. But if it does matter, weigh it and divide it. So here's what my dough looks like. Let me move this so you can see. John will take this from you. Oh, okay, thank you. And in fact, I am going to use my scale. Now I know that almost always, when I make a double batch, I divide it by 50 because I make these rolls almost always 38 grams. And so when I'm making rolls, so what I'll do is I'll spread it out like that. Then I'll begin to just cut off a line. And I usually make about five of these horizontal cuts. And I'll turn my scale on, I'll cut it, put it on my scale. Then I'll cut a little more. That's 39, that's close enough for me. I'll make the next one 37. So I take it. In my surface where it's oiled, right? I've got 39 
What I'm going to do is I'm going to make like a cloth with my with my hand like this so that my fingertips are on the table. I'm not pushing down like this. I want my fingertips on. And I'm going to kind of make a circle like that. Not pressing down too, too much. I don't have any parchment, I don't think. But that's okay. Can somebody give me a piece of parchment? Right? I'm just making a... Just making a ball like that. Okay. And then I go, got another one, 40. So what I do with my scale, that one's 37 now, I put that little piece right there. Because if the next one's 35, I'll add that one to it, right? So thank you, just, um, just put it here. Thank you. Same thing. Just forming this ball. Um, somebody want to go ahead and pass out the dough to them? So you are kind of pressing down a little bit, but you're using your fingertips to make sure you don't press down too much. And you'll feel it. And there is a sweet spot when you have just enough oil on your, on your table. You can have too much or too little. If you have too little, you'll notice that your dough is really sticking to it. If you have too much, it's just sliding all over the place. There's a kind of a sweet spot when you get just enough, and you'll feel it. So just make it balls like that. Okay? okay? So you've got your dough. Uh, you have about 120, um, 120 grams of, uh, of dough there. So if you divide that, if you want to make uh, 40, 38 gram, 40 gram uh, rolls, just divide that into three equal parts and you'll be okay. So if you just divide that into three, they should be about 40, about 40 grams each. And go ahead and make three and put them on your parchment. And what we're going to do after we let these, after we formed these, is we're going to let them rise a second time for about 20 minutes. And then they go in the oven. And now let me tell you this, using this same method, you don't have to make them into rolls. Like I said, you could make them into, into bigger rolls. You could also make them into breadsticks. Right, so make them make them long, and then and then bake them. Then you could put garlic butter on them. You could do all kinds of things. For instance, <coughs> while you're doing that, let me just tell you something I did this week. So I, this is a single um, recipe, the the same one that you're making. And what I did was I took cheddar. I laid it out. I took uh, shredded cheddar cheese, and put cheddar cheese all over it. Um, I have it written down somewhere how much I use. Probably about 500 grams. I put the shredded cheddar, cheddar cheese in it and sort of folded it up. Oh, there! this is a video of how I did that. Just, just worked that cheddar into the dough and then formed it into a loaf. and then put it in this loaf pan. There it is in the loaf pan. And again, same recipe. Just, just, just added about 500 grams of cheddar cheese and worked it in. Baked it uh, about, um, uh, it took a little longer, it took about 22 minutes to bake this. Um, and about five minutes before it was done, I sprinkled some more cheddar on top of it. So that's why it has Cheddar on top of it. Tasha, do we have that available? Oh, there it is. Yeah, that's it. That's it right there on the cutting board. So let me tell you what else I did with a single um, with a single recipe of this. So what I did um, was uh, I took the single recipe, I took the dough out, I spread it out like we did. I used a rolling pin to roll it out to get it to about an inch thick. And then I used uh, butter and cinnamon and sugar and made a paste 
and then spread that all over the, the rectangle and then rolled it up, cut it into 12 rolls, and so made cinnamon rolls. And Taj is going to put some glaze on top of these and we'll try these in just a minute. But again, same exact dough recipe, just added butter and sugar and cinnamon. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you the ratios I use. I wanted to use brown sugar. They'd be better if I used brown sugar, but I didn't have any. So I just used granulated sugar. So you'll know this is what how it comes out. They're still going to be delicious. So. Again, same recipe. Same recipe. So how much butter sugar and cinnamon? Let me look that up. Thank you. Um, it's about 175 butter, 250 sugar and about two and a half tablespoons of cinnamon. And then I whizzed that up in the food processor. You know, it was, it was softened butter, and then just spread that out. You can do it with a whisk as well. Yeah, because yeah, you want to get it to where it'll spread and it doesn't tear the dough. Um, so good, so. Um, well, while, Tasha, can we set a 15 minute timer? Of course. Okay. And we'll let these rise. And while we're doing that, let's just talk just briefly about sourdough bread. Now, basically today we've moved from very simple, that, that soda bread biscuit recipe and the kacha and the pizza crust, that kind of thing. Super easy, super um, quick, you know, it doesn't take long at all, to a little more, you know, time consuming. Um, this, you know, from start to finish, making these rolls will take you two and a half, three hours. You know, but again, you've got an hour and a half to do something else because it's just rising. It's not, you're not busy all the time. Um, sourdough bread, however, is typically much more time intensive and much more sort of um, footery. There's a lot, you know, you have to watch out for it a lot. You, a lot of steps you need to do. And sometimes people will read about, um, about how to make sourdough in books like like these two and I have to say these are two of my favorite books this is uh, Richard Burton Hayes Dough this is really a really good book and then this is Flour Water Salt Yeast by Ken Forkish that's some beautiful bread that's when I first got this book I said I'm gonna make bread that looks like that <laughs> someday this is excellent um, some people who want to make sourdough they'll get on They'll go online and they'll read how technical people are about hydration percentages and bulk fermentation and cold fermentation and and you know poolishes and levans and oh you know and and, and dry uh, uh, thick starters and uh, and they just get overwhelmed by it and you can get overwhelmed but there's no need to because here's the deal with sourdough starters. Sourdough starter, all it is is yeast. Yeah, no, actually, yeah, go ahead. Because I was thinking about patting it out, but I think it's okay. Um, so basically all this is is yeast. <laughs> we go to the store and we buy yeast in a little container or in a little packet. But for the past few thousand years, if you wanted to make yeast bread, you want to put yeast in here, this is the container that it was in. And that's all that sourdough starter is, is it was a way to contain yeast, to keep it, to keep it alive so that you could use it to make bread that would rise. Now for thousands of years, people didn't know that there was yeast in here. It wasn't until Louis Pasteur and those folks came along and said, well, what's in this that makes bread rise? And they figured out it was Saccharomyces cerevisiae. But the difference between that little packet of yeast that you get at the supermarket uh, and this is that little packet at the supermarket is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, you know, produced under basically laboratory conditions and it's all the same. Every packet, you know, it's pretty much the same. This is my sourdough starter and somebody else's sourdough starter can be vastly different, not only in the yeast that it contains, but, and this is where the sourdough, where the sour comes from, it also contains what are called lactic acid bacteria that produce lactic acid that make it sour. Now, lactic acid bacteria are the same bacteria that 
ferment vegetables like sauerkraut and make kimchi and things like that. So when you do lacto-fermentation, you're making use of the lactic acid bacteria that are in here. Where did they come from? Well, they come from all kinds of places. They come from your hands. They probably traditionally, way back, way back when, they came from sweat and tears and, you know, and, and at some point, thousands of years ago, somebody figured out that something happened to that flower and it grew and they didn't know why <laughs> but they knew how to make this stuff as as early as um 2000 years ago there was a guy named pliny the elder he was a historian and he compiled recipes and things and he um he was writing in rome this was over 2000 years ago and he said if you want to make a really good sourdough starter do flour and water and go out on the hills outside of rome and get some grapes at the time of harvest. He was very specific about grapes at the time of harvest. And that's when they would that's when they would burst open and the wasps would come and visit them. Now what's interesting about that? And that would make a really strong sourdough starter. He didn't know why. He just said this is the way to do it if you're going to make a good strong <coughs> sourdough starter. But now we know that in nature there are two places where you can find an abundance of Saccharomyces cerevisiae that microbe that's yeast right and it's in the stomachs of wasps and on the broken skins of grapes so what they were doing when they used those grapes at time of harvest was they were inoculating their sourdough starter with with baker's yeast they just didn't know it it took 2000 years to figure that out pretty cool so if you're interested in in using sourdough and i have some sourdough starters that you can take home with you if you'd like to now I didn't want to for you to come here and get homework. You know, get, get here's an assignment. Here, go take care of this because you do have to feed your sourdough starter. Either if you keep it out on the counter, you have to feed it every day. If you keep it in the refrigerator, you need to feed it about once a week. I have neglected mine for up to <laughs> like six weeks before and still brought it back because it's a good strong starter. Now I started growing this starter about 11 years ago uh, at our farm and uh, started it with uh, rye flour and some local honey and uh, a few years later a friend of ours who'd had a sourdough starter that had been in her family for over a hundred years her grandmother had started it her great-grandmother uh, she gave me some of hers and I mixed it in here so in this is you know the descendants of microbes that have been sourdough starter for a hundred years and on two continents by the way because because we freeze dried it and then brought it over and resurrected it now <laughs> that doesn't mean that this starter has the same stuff in it the same yeast the same microbes that her great-great-grandmother used it's more like saying her great-great-grandmother lived in lards and now we live in lards in the same location population is quite different but it's the descendants of the people who used to, the microbes who used to live there so that's how so that's how it works so when you when you use sourdough starter all you're doing is adding lactic acid bacteria and yeasts to a recipe and one of the easiest ways to start using um, sourdough starter to get that sourdough taste is to take a recipe and if you're very careful about feeding this, and this is why I, need, I say you need a scale, you know that this starter is half water, half flour, because I'm very diligent about, when I feed it, I feed it with 100 grams of water. I weigh my water, because a gram of water weighs, it, uh, a gram of water is a milliliter of water, it's the same thing. Uh, 100 grams of water, 100 grams of flour, every time. So this is 50-50 water to flour, so if I weigh out 200 grams, it's 100 grams of water, 100 grams of flour every time. So I can take that recipe for rolls that you have, and I can say, hmm, so if I wanted to add 200 grams of sourdough starter to that, to give it that nice sourdough taste, then I need to take off 100 grams of water and 100 grams of flour that are in it, and I can add that to it. <clears throat> right? Does that make sense? Yep. So that's why I print it out for you. Now, when you do that and you add, you still add yeast, 
you're you're not adding any yeast that's not already in that. You're just adding more so it saves you time. And that's called a type two sourdough. Most of the sourdough that you buy in supermarkets is type two sourdough. They've added sourdough starter to it for the flavor, but they still use yeast for consistency and time. You can do a type one sourdough starter, and that's when you don't use any commercial yeast at all. That's when it really takes time. It can take a long time, and I'll show you an example of that in just a minute. But I wanted to share this with you um, because I made these rolls this week, type two rolls, and we'll taste some in just a minute. They took exactly the same amount of time as the, as the typical recipe, but they have that nice sourdough taste. So one more thing I'm gonna tell you that we do uh, before we put these rolls in the oven, and that is I typically brush them with an egg wash that's just a whole egg mixed up really well. You can just use the yolk if you want to. You'll get a, a nice darker color. You can just use the white if you want to. You'll get a nice shine without so much color. You can use milk if you want to. It, you know, you'll, get, you'll get a little less and it'll be a little softer. You could use butter if you wanted to. That'll give you a nice soft outside crust. The egg tends to give it that little kind of a little crunch. I like the egg. So what I'm gonna do, here's, here's my rolls. I'm gonna put my brush in my egg. I'm just gonna brush that egg on them like that. Just dip, just dip it in and brush it on. And then, I take my scissors, and I'm just gonna snip each one like that. Oh, it kind of hurts you to do it, but wait till you see what happens. So I'm gonna pass these around. If you'll brush them, you'll just brush your, brush your rolls. And I can do the cutting for you, or you can, you don't have to do that. If, if you don't do that, then, then they're going to expand and crack, um, you know, in, in certain organic ways. And but that's if you okay. Do that, but if you do that, you know exactly where they're going to expand. And that's the reason you'd score them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yep. That, that is, yeah. And that's what you're doing is you're saying, expand here. Mm -hmm. And you'll see in just a minute, the sourdough that I do, did you see the sourdough on the front of that book? It had those cracks. That's because he didn't score it. And I like, and he recommends that because it, it has a more natural look. It just, you never know what it's going to come out, you know. But if you score it, you know it's going to do right there. And some people do beautiful scoring. All right, let me tell you a little bit more about um, about the sourdough. Because I made, I made some sourdough uh, <coughs> starting yesterday. I started yesterday morning and mixed up my dough. That's my dough in my ubiquitous bowl. That was at 5.55 last night. I had been working on it all day. You, um, what you do is you mix the dough. Oh, you, well, you, first you mix the starter, you let it rise. Then you mix the dough and you stretch and fold it every 30 minutes. I did that for about six hours every 30 minutes. <coughs> and then at 5.55 uh, last evening, I put it in the refrigerator where it stayed until about 5.30 this morning. I took it out, put it into what's called a vanitin. That is, that's this thing. It's made of bamboo and it's got rice flour inside it that I put there. And so you, you, you put your dough in there and, and let it rise. And then I put it into, remember that uh, cast iron pot I was telling you about? That's it on parchment <coughs> in the cast iron pot. That's with the lid on. Uh, cooked it for an hour. Certain temperatures you have to cook it at. And when it came out, it looked like that. Let me show it to you. So there it is. Pretty close. Huh? So we'll eat some of this in, uh, in just a minute. And like I said, you know, you got to have some patience too, uh, but, I know, I but you cannot, right. you cannot rush this flavor because, you know, it's worth, it's worth the time and the effort to have people bite into it and say, this is the best bread I've ever tasted in my life. How did you make that taste like this? Because it, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not the cast iron pan. Say it again. Your cast iron pan. Mm -hmm. Could you use a taji? 
Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah, and um, you know, there are, um, what I do when I made that bread in the, the loaf pan, I have a big Dutch, o Dutch oven. It's like a Le Creuset, you know, it's an enameled pan, but that will fit into it. So I put that in the oven first, let it preheat, and then I put that in it and put the lid on. I also put two ice cubes in there so it produces steam. And then about the last 15 minutes, I'll take the lid off, let it get brown on top. I'll need to get my hands because I've got to eat my hands off. Okay, let's talk about what's over here real quick. Um, and then people can continue to ask questions yeah. while they take things. Okay. Yeah, so what So what we have um, are the type 2 and type 1 yes. rolls. Which is switch? This is type 1. This is type 2. Uh -huh. This is yeast. And then we have some additional biscuits. Oh, okay. We have gravy, focaccia. That's the focaccia we that okay. I made earlier. Yeah. So this is your. That's that cheese loaf that I made. Yeah, this is the cheese loaf. These are the cinnamon, cinnamon rolls. rolls. And then we have this. And then this is the sourdough. Then it's, it's, the sourdough. it's called a, it's called a boule, B-O-U-L-E. Yeah. It's just a ball, basically a bubble. Is what the, so. And I'll, I'll cut it. Yeah. Oh, oh, and here, and I tell you, when you take this out of the oven, the way you know you've done it right is it'll sing because it cracks. It'll it'll make this crackling noise for about five to ten minutes as it expands a little more in the in the cold. Mm -hmm. And also, oh yeah, and if it sounds like a drum, it's done. And then the, the next thing you want to do is see what the crumb looks like. That means how big the bubbles are. And I like kind of a medium crumb. A lot of, a lot of people online will go for these great big holes, and that's fine, and it looks pretty, but try to make a sandwich out of that. You know? I'll, everything falls out. So, so I don't necessarily aim for that. As, oh. I don't know. They, they just aborted mine. Didn't want to put mine in. So, so I cut some of this over here. See my crown? I think I can stop the. Uh, 